each event, transaction, or message triggers a corresponding action. The programmer can represent the program steps in pseudocode initially or use case tools and code generators to create O minus O code directly from the object model. Chapter Introduction Chapter 11 describes the system's implementation phase of the SDLC. Managing systems implementation involves paying constant attention to quality assurance throughout the activities of application development, coding, testing, documentation, and installation. The system design specification serves as a blueprint for constructing the new system. The initial task is application development, which requires systems analysts and programmers to work together to construct the necessary programs and code modules. Before a changeover, the system must be tested and documented carefully, users must be trained, and existing data must be converted. After the new system is operational, a formal evaluation of the results takes place as part of a final report to management. The chapter includes three case in point discussion questions to help contextualize the concepts described in the text. The question of ethics concerns with an issue that all testers have to deal when to stop testing. In the example, there is an ethical question raised about whether or not a 90% pass rate is sufficient to ship the product, assuming the remaining bugs will be fixed once the system is operational. Learning Objectives When you finish this chapter, you should be able to 1. Explain quality assurance and 3 techniques to help improve the finished product. 2. Outline application development. 3. Apply structured development. 4. Apply object-oriented development. 5. Apply agile development. 6. Explain coding. 7. Explain unit, integration, and system testing. 8. Differentiate between program, system, operations, and user documentation. 9. Explain the role of online documentation. 10. Describe the five tasks involved in system installation. Chapter Introduction Chapter 11 describes the system's implementation phase of the SDLC. Managing systems implementation involves paying constant attention to quality assurance throughout the activities of application development, coding, testing, documentation, and installation. The system design specification serves as a blueprint for constructing the new system. The initial task is application development which requires systems analysts and programmers to work together to construct the necessary programs and code modules. Before a changeover, the system must be tested and documented carefully, users must be trained, and existing data must be converted. After the new system is operational, a formal evaluation of the results takes place as part of a final report to management. The chapter includes three case in point discussion questions to help contextualize the concepts described in the text. The question of ethics concerns with an issue that all testers have to deal when to stop testing. In the example, there is an ethical question raised about whether or not a 90% pass rate is sufficient to ship the product, assuming the remaining bugs will be fixed once the system is operational. Learning Objectives When you finish this chapter, you should be able to 1. Explain quality assurance and 3 techniques to help improve the finished product. 2. Outline application development. 3. Apply structured development. 4. Apply object-oriented development. 5. Apply agile development. 6. Explain coding. 7. Explain unit, integration, and system testing. 8. Differentiate between program system, operations, and user documentation. 9. Explain the role of online documentation. 10. Describe the five tasks involved in system installation. Software Engineering Software engineering is the discipline application of engineering principles to the creation of complex, long-lived applications. It is an amalgam of people, process, and technology. Software engineering is broader than just development. It includes five technical activity areas, requirements, design, 
construction, testing, and maintenance and evolution. It is supported by non-technical activities such as cost and effort estimation, project management, and process improvement. The website for the Software Engineering Institute, SEI, at Carnegie Mellon University is shown in Figure 11-1. SEI is a leader in software engineering and provides quality standards and suggested procedures for software developers and systems analysts. SEI's primary objective is to find better, faster, and less expensive methods of software development. To achieve that goal, SEI designed an influential set of software development standards called the Capability Maturity Model CMM, in parenthesis, Registered Trademark which has been used successfully by thousands of organizations around the globe. The purpose of the model is to improve software quality, reduce development time, and cut costs. The five maturity levels of the software CMM are shown in Figure 11-2. After the original software CMM was released and updated, other CMMs were introduced. Eventually the SEI established a new model, called Capability Maturity Model Integration CMMI, in parenthesis, registered trademark, that integrates software and systems development into a much larger framework. The CMMI tracks an organization's processes, using five maturity levels, from level 1, which is referred to as unpredictable, poorly controlled, and reactive, to level 5, in which the optimal result is process improvement. Systems Engineering Systems Engineering not only builds upon software engineering but also includes other parts of the overall system, such as hardware, networks, and interfaces. Trade organizations such as INCOS and the IEEE Systems Council provide guidance on best practices and emerging technologies in systems engineering. As shown in Figure 11-3, Systems analysts can benefit from a holistic approach to large-scale problem-solving by adopting a broader perspective. International Organization for Standardization What do automobiles, water, and software have in common? Along with thousands of other products and services, they are all covered by standards from the International Organization for Standardization (ISO) which was discussed in Chapter 9. ISO standards include everything from internationally recognized symbols, such as those shown in Figure 11-4 to the ISBN numbering system that identifies this text. In addition, ISO seeks to offer a global consensus of what constitutes good management practices that can help firms deliver consistently high-quality products and services, including software. Because software is so important to a company's success, many firms seek assurance that software systems, either purchased or developed in-house, will meet rigid quality standards. In 2014, ISO updated a set of guidelines, called ISO 9000-3 to 2014, that provided a QA framework for developing and maintaining software. A company can specify ISO standards when it purchases software from a supplier or use ISO guidelines for in-house software development to ensure that the final result measures up to ISO standards. ISO requires a specific development plan, which outlines a step-by-step -step process for transforming user requirements into a finished product. ISO standards can be quite detailed. For example, ISO requires that a software supplier document all testing and maintain records of test results. If problems are found, they must be resolved, and any modules affected must be retested. Additionally, software and hardware specifications of all test equipment must be documented and included in the test records. Application Development Application development is the process of constructing the programs and code modules that serve as the building blocks of the information system. In Chapter 1, it was explained that structured analysis, object-oriented, parenthesis, O minus O, in parenthesis, analysis, and agile methods are three popular development options. Regardless of the method, the objective is to translate the design into program and code modules that will function properly. Regardless of whether structured analysis, O-O design, or Agile methods are used, 
Even a modest-sized project might have hundreds or even thousands of modules. For this reason, application development can become quite complex and difficult to manage. At this stage, project management is especially important to control schedules and budgets. Users and managers are looking forward to the new system, and it is very important to set realistic schedules, meet project deadlines, control costs, and maintain quality. To achieve these goals, the systems analyst or project manager should use project management tools and techniques similar to those described in Chapter 3 to monitor and control the development effort. Review the system design. At this point, it is helpful to review the tasks involved in the creation of the system design. Chapter 4 focused on requirements modeling and how to use functional decomposition diagrams, FDDs, to break complex business operations down into smaller units, or functions. Chapter 5 focused on structured data and process modeling, and data flow diagrams, DFDs. The development of process descriptions for functional primitive processes that documented the business logic and processing requirements was also discussed. Chapter 6 focused on an O-O model of the new system that included use case diagrams, class diagrams, sequence diagrams, state transition diagrams, and activity diagrams. Chapter 7 focused on selecting a development strategy. Chapter 8 focused on designing the user interface. Chapter 9 focused on data design issues, analyzing relationships between system entities, and constructing entity relationship diagrams, ERDs. Chapter 10 focused on overall system architecture considerations. Taken together, this set of tasks produced an overall design and a plan for physical implementation. Application Development Tasks if traditional structured or O-O methods were used during system design, the process of translating the design into a functioning application can begin. If an agile development method was selected, development begins with planning the project, followed by laying the groundwork, assembling the team, and preparing to interact with the customers. Traditional Methods Building a new system requires careful planning. After an overall strategy is established, Individual modules must be designed, coded, tested, and documented. A module consists of related program code organized into small units that are easy to understand and maintain. After the modules are developed and tested individually, more testing takes place, along with thorough documentation of the entire system, as shown in Figure 11-5. When program modules are created using structured or O-O methods, the process starts by reviewing requirements documentation from prior SDLC phases and creating a set of program designs. If a documentation file was built early in the development process and updated regularly, there is a valuable repository of information. The documentation centerpiece is the system design specification, accompanied by diagrams, source documents, screen layouts, report designs, data dictionary entries and user comments. If a case tool was used during the system's analysis and design process, the analyst's job will be much easier. At this point, coding and testing tasks begin. Although programmers typically perform the actual coding, IT managers usually assign systems analysts to work with them as a team. Agile Methods If an agile approach is decided upon, Intense communication and collaboration will now begin between the IT team and the users or customers. The objective is to create the system through an iterative process of planning, designing, coding, and testing. Agile projects use various iterative and incremental models, including extreme programming, parenthesis, XP, in parenthesis, as shown in Figure 11-6. Agile development and XP are discussed more later in this chapter. Systems Development Tools Each systems development approach has its own set of tools that has worked well for that method. For example, structured development relies heavily on DFDs and structure charts. O-O methods use a variety of UML diagrams, including use case, class, sequence, and transition state diagrams. 
and Agile methods tend to use spiral or other iterative models such as the example shown in Figure 11-6. System developers also can use multi-purpose tools to help them translate the system logic into properly functioning program modules. These generic tools include ERDs, flow charts, pseudocode, decision tables, and decision trees. Entity Relationship Diagrams During Data Design, Chapter 9, in parenthesis, the use of ERDs to show the interaction among system entities and objects was described. An ERD is a useful tool regardless of which methodology used, because the various relationships, one-to-one, one-to-many, and many-to-many, must be understood and implemented in the application development process. Flowcharts As described in Chapter 5, flowcharts can be used to represent program logic and are very useful in visualizing a modular design. A flowchart represents logical rules and interaction graphically, using a series of symbols connected by arrows. Using flowcharts, Programmers can break large systems into subsystems and modules that are easier to understand and code. Pseudocode Pseudocode is a technique for representing program logic. Pseudocode is similar to structured English, which was explained in Chapter 5. Pseudocode is not language-specific, so it can be used to describe a software module in plain English without requiring strict syntax rules. Using pseudocode, a systems analyst or a programmer can describe program actions that can be implemented in any programming language. Figure 11-7 illustrates an example of pseudocode that documents a sales promotion policy. Figure 11-7 Sample of a sales promotion policy with logical rules, top, and a pseudocode version of the same policy, bottom. Note the alignment and indentation of the logic statements in the pseudocode. Decision Tables and Decision Trees As explained in Chapter 5, decision tables and decision trees can be used to model business logic for an information system. In addition to being used as modeling tools, analysts and programmers can use decision tables and decision trees during system development, as code modules that implement the logical rules are developed. Figure 11-8 shows an example of a decision tree that documents the sales promotion policy shown in Figure 11-7. Note that the decision tree accurately reflects the sales promotion policy, which has three separate conditions and four possible outcomes. Structured Development Structured application development usually involves a top-down approach which proceeds from a general design to a detailed structure. After a systems analyst documents the system's requirements, he or she breaks the system down into subsystems and modules in a process called partitioning. This approach also is called modular design and is similar to constructing a leveled set of DFDs. By assigning modules to different programmers, several development areas can proceed at the same time. As explained in Chapter 3, Project management software can be used to monitor work on each module, forecast overall development time, estimate required human and technical resources, and calculate a critical path for the project. Because all the modules must work together properly, an analyst must proceed carefully, with constant input from programmers and IT management to achieve a sound, well-integrated structure. The analyst also must ensure that integration capability is built into each design and thoroughly tested. Structure Charts Structure charts show the program modules and the relationships among them. A structure chart consists of rectangles that represent the program modules, with arrows and other symbols that provide additional information. Typically, a higher level module called a control module, directs lower level modules, called subordinate modules. In a structure chart, symbols represent various actions or conditions. Structure chart symbols represent modules, data couples, control couples, conditions, and loops. Module A rectangle represents a module, as shown in figure 11-9. In the figure, Vertical lines at the edges of a rectangle indicate that Module 1.3 is a library module. A library module is reusable code and can be invoked from more than one point in the chart. Data Couple 
an arrow with an empty circle represents a data couple. A data couple shows data that one module passes to another. In the data couple example shown in figure 11-10, the lookup customer name module exchanges data with the maintain customer data module. Control couple. An arrow with a filled circle represents a control couple. A control couple shows a message, also called a status flag, that one module sends to another. In the example shown in figure 11-11, the update customer file module sends an account overdue flag back to the maintain customer data module. A module uses a flag to signal a specific condition or action to another module. Condition A line with a diamond on one end represents a condition. A condition line indicates that a control module determines which subordinate modules will be invoked, depending on a specific condition. In the example shown in figure 11-12, sort inventory parts is a control module with a condition line that triggers one of the three subordinate modules. Loop. A curved arrow represents a loop. A loop indicates that one or more modules are repeated. In the example shown in figure 11-13, the get student grades and calculate GPA modules are repeated. Cohesion and coupling. Cohesion and coupling are important tools for evaluating the overall design. As explained in the following sections, it is desirable to have modules that are highly cohesive and loosely coupled. Otherwise, system maintenance becomes more costly due to difficulties in making changes to the system structure. Cohesion measures a module's scope and processing characteristics. A module that performs a single function or task has a high degree of cohesion, which is desirable. Because it focuses on a single task, a cohesive module is much easier to code and reuse. For example, a module named Verify Customer Number is more cohesive than a module named Calculate and Print Statements. If the word AND is found in a module name, this implies that more than one task is involved. If a module must perform multiple tasks, more complex coding is required and the module will be more difficult to create and maintain. To make a module more cohesive, split it into separate units, each with a single function. For example, by splitting the module check customer number and credit limit in figure 11-14 into two separate modules, check customer number and check customer credit limit, cohesion is greatly improved. Coupling describes the degree of interdependence among modules. Modules that are independent are loosely coupled, which is desirable. Loosely coupled modules are easier to maintain and modify, because the logic in one module does not affect other modules. If a programmer needs to update a loosely coupled module, he or she can accomplish the task in a single location. If modules are tightly coupled, one module is linked to internal logic contained in another module. For example, Module A might refer to an internal variable contained in Module B. In that case, a logic error in the Module B will affect the processing in Module A. For that reason, passing a status flag down as a message from a control module is generally regarded as poor design. It is better to have subordinate modules handle processing tasks as independently as possible, to avoid a cascade effect of logic errors in the control module. In Figure 11-15, the tightly coupled example on the left shows that the subordinate module calculate current charges depends on a status flag sent down from the control module update customer balance. It would be preferable to have the modules loosely coupled and logically independent. In the example on the right, a status flag is not needed because the subordinate module apply discount handles discount processing independently. Any logic errors are confined to a single location, the applied discount module. Drawing a structure chart. If a structured analysis method was used during system design, the structure charts will be based on the DFDs created during data and process modeling. Typically, three steps are followed when creating a structure chart. DFDs are reviewed to identify the processes and methods, identify the program modules and determine control subordinate relationships, and add symbols for couples and loops. Afterward, the structure chart is analyzed to ensure that it is consistent with the system documentation. 
Step 1. Review the DFDS. The first step is to review all DFDs for accuracy and completeness, especially if changes have occurred since the system's analysis phase. If object models also were developed, they should be analyzed to identify the objects, the methods that each object must perform, and the relationships among the objects. A method is similar to a functional primitive and requires code to implement the necessary actions. Step 2. Identify modules and relationships. Working from the logical model, functional primitives or object methods are transformed into program modules. When analyzing a set of DFDs, remember that each DFD level represents a processing level. If DFDs are being used, one works way down from the context diagram to the lower level diagrams, identifying control modules and subordinate modules, until the functional primitives are reached. If more cohesion is desired, processes can be divided into smaller modules that handle a single task. Figure 11-16 shows a structure chart based on the order system from Chapter 5. Note how the three-level structure chart relates to the three DFD levels. Step 3. Add couples, loops, and conditions. Next, couples, loops, and conditions are added to the structure chart. If DFDs are being used, the data flows and the data dictionary can be reviewed to identify the data elements that pass from one module to another. In addition to adding the data couples, control couples are added where a module is sending a control parameter, or flag, to another module. Loops and condition lines that indicate repetitive or alternative processing steps are also added, as shown in figure 11-16. If an object model was developed, the class diagrams and object relationship diagrams can be reviewed to be sure that the interaction among the objects is fully understood. At this point, the structure chart is ready for careful analysis. Each process, data element, or object method should be checked to ensure that the chart reflects all previous documentation and that the logic is correct. All modules should be strongly cohesive and loosely coupled. Often, several versions of the chart must be drawn. Some case tools can help analyze the chart and identify problem areas. Object-Oriented Development O-O methods were described in Chapter 6. O-O analysis makes it easier to translate an object model directly into an O-O programming language. This process is called Object-Oriented Development, OOD. Although many structured design concepts also apply to O-O methodology, there are some differences. Characteristics of Object-Oriented Development When implementing a structured design, a structure chart is used to describe the interaction between program modules, as explained earlier. In contrast, when implementing an O-O design, relationships between objects already exist. Because object interaction is defined during the O-O analysis process, the object model itself represents the application's structure. As Chapter 6 explains, objects contain both data and program logic called methods. Individual object instances belong to classes of objects with similar characteristics. The relationship and interaction among classes are described using a class diagram, such as the one shown in Figure 11-17. A class diagram includes the class attributes, which describe the characteristics of objects in the class, and methods, which represent program logic. For example, the customer class describes customer objects. Customer attributes include number, name, address, and so on. Methods for the customer class include place order, modify order, and pay invoice, among others. The customer class can exchange messages with the order class. In addition to class diagrams, programmers get an overview of object interaction by using object relationship diagrams that were developed during the O-O analysis process. For example, figure 11-18 shows an object relationship diagram for a fitness center. Note that the model shows the objects and how they interact to perform business functions and transactions. Properly implemented, object-oriented development can speed up projects reduce costs, and improve overall quality. 
However, these results are not always achieved. Organizations sometimes have unrealistic expectations and do not spend enough time learning about, preparing for, and implementing the OOD process. For example, no one would build a bridge without an analysis of needs, supporting data, and a detailed blueprint and the bridge would not be opened for traffic until it had been carefully inspected and checked to ensure that all specifications were met. O-O software developers sometimes forget that the basic rules of architecture also apply to their projects. In summary, to secure the potential benefits of OOD, systems analysts must carefully analyze, design, implement, test, and document their O-O projects. Implementation of Object-Oriented Designs when a programmer translates an O minus O design into an application, he or she analyzes the classes, attributes, methods, and messages that are documented in the object model. During this process, the programmer makes necessary revisions and updates to class diagrams, sequence diagrams, state transition diagrams, and activity diagrams. The programmer's main objective is to translate object methods into program code modules and determine what event or message will trigger the execution of each module. To accomplish the task, the programmer analyzes sequence diagrams and state transition diagrams that show the events and messages that trigger changes to an object. O-O applications are called event-driven because each event, transaction, or message triggers a corresponding action. The programmer can represent the program steps in pseudocode initially or use case tools and code generators to create O minus O code directly from the object model. Object oriented cohesion and coupling. The principles of cohesion and coupling also apply to O minus O application development. Classes should be as loosely coupled, independent of other classes, as possible. In addition, an object's methods also should be loosely coupled, independent of other methods, and highly cohesive, perform closely related actions. By following these principles, classes and objects are easier to understand and edit. O-O programmers who ignore cohesion and coupling concepts may end up creating a web of code that is difficult to maintain. When code is scattered in various places, editing becomes complicated and expensive. Agile Development As stated in Chapter 1, Agile Development is a distinctly different systems development method. It shares many of the steps found in traditional development but uses a highly iterative process. The development team is in constant communication with the primary user, who is called the customer, shaping and forming the system to match the customer's specifications. Agile development is aptly named because it is based on a quick and the nimble development process that easily adapts to change. Agile development focuses on small teams, intense communication, and rapid development iterations. The four key values of Agile software development are shown in Figure 11-19. Programmers can use popular Agile-friendly languages such as Python, Ruby, and Perl. However, Agile methods do not require a specific programming language, and programmers also use various O-O languages such as Java, C++, C Sharp, and others. As with traditional methodologies, Agile development has both positive and negative characteristics. Today, Agile methodology is very popular for software projects. Its supporters boast that it speeds up software development and delivers precisely what the customer wants, when the customer wants it, while fostering teamwork and empowering employees. However, there are drawbacks to this adaptive rather than predictive method. Critics of Agile development often claim that because it focuses on quick iterations and fast releases, it lacks discipline and produces systems of questionable quality. In addition, Agile methodology generally does not work as well for larger projects because of their complexity and the lack of focus on a well-defined end product. Before implementing Agile development, the proposed system and development methods should be examined carefully. As experienced IT professionals know, a one-size-fits-all solution does not exist. For more information on Agile methods, 
refer to the discussion of systems development methods in Chapter 1 and Agile methods such as Scrum in Chapter 4. Extreme Programming XP is an Agile development method. It is an iterative approach, as shown in Figure 11-20, where a team of users and developers immerse themselves in systems development. XP supporters emphasize a values such as simplicity, communication, feedback, respect, and courage. Success requires strong commitment to the process, corporate support, and dedicated team members. XP uses a concept called pair programming. In pair programming, two programmers work on the same task on the same computer. One drives, programs, while the other navigates, watches. The onlooker examines the code strategically to see the forest while the driver is concerned with the individual trees immediately in front of him or her. The two discuss their ideas continuously throughout the process. Another important concept in XP is that unit tests are designed before code is written. This test-driven development, TDD, focuses on end results from the beginning and prevents programmers from straying from their goals. Because of the magnitude and intensity of the multi-cycle process, Agile testing relies heavily on automated testing methods. User Stories Suppose that a customer has requested a sales tracking system. The first step in an Agile process, like any other development method, would be to define the system requirements. The customer begins by meeting with programmers and providing user stories. A user story is a short, simple requirements definition. Programmers review user stories to determine the project's requirements, priorities, and scope. Here are three user story examples. As the sales manager, I want to identify fast or slow moving items so I can manage our inventory more effectively. As a store manager, I need enough lead time to replenish my stock, so I don't run out of hot items. As a sales representative, I want to offer the best selection of fast selling items and clear out the old stock that is not moving. User stories do not deal with technical details and are so short that they are often written on index cards. Each user story is given a priority by the customer, so the requirements can be ranked. In addition, programmers assign a score to each user story that indicates the estimated difficulty of implementation. This information helps the team form a plan and assign its resources. Projects are often composed of many user stories, which taken together form epics, for which programmers can estimate the scope, time requirements, and difficulty of the project. In addition to the user stories, frequent face-to-face -face meetings with customers provide a higher level of detail as the project progresses. Iterations and Releases The team must also develop a release plan, which specifies when user stories will be implemented and the timing of the releases. Releases are relatively frequent and each system release is like a prototype that can be tested and modified as needed. User stories are implemented in a series of iteration cycles. An iteration cycle includes planning, designing, coding, and testing of one or more features based on user stories. At the beginning of each iteration cycle, which is often two weeks long, the team holds an iteration planning meeting to break down the user stories into specific tasks that are assigned to team members. As new user stories or features are added, the team reviews and modifies the release plan. As with any development process, success is determined by the customer's approval. The programming team regularly meets with the customer, who test prototype releases as they become available. This process usually results in additional user stories, and changes are implemented in the next iteration cycle. As the project's code changes during each iteration, obsolete code is removed and remaining code is restructured to keep the system up to date. The iteration cycles continue until all user stories have been implemented, tested, and accepted. Coding Coding is the process of turning program logic into specific instructions that the computer system can execute. Working from a specific design, a programmer uses a programming language to transform program logic into code statements. 
an individual programmer might create a small program, while larger programs typically are divided into modules that several individuals or groups can work on simultaneously. Each developer has their favorite programming environment and standards to make coding easier. Visual Basic, Java, and Python are examples of commonly used programming languages, and many commercial packages use a proprietary set of commands. As the trend toward Internet-based and mobile applications continues, HTML, XML, JavaScript, Swift, and other web-centric languages will be used extensively. To simplify the integration of system components and reduce code development time, many programmers use an integrated development environment, IDE. IDEs can make it easier to program interactive software products by providing built-in tools and advanced features, such as real-time error detection, syntax hints, highlighted code, class browsers, and version control. Apple XCODE and Microsoft NET are popular IDEs. In addition to these commercial packages, programmers can use open-source IDEs such as Eclipse. Earlier chapters explained that systems analysts use application generators, report writers, screen generators, fourth-generation languages, and other case tools that produce code directly from program design specifications. Some commercial applications can generate editable program code directly from macros, keystrokes, or mouse actions. For example, IBM's Rational Toolset can generate code fragments based on UML design documents. This can help with QA. Testing After coding, a programmer must test each program to make sure it functions correctly. Later, programs are tested in groups, and finally the development team must test the entire system. The first step is to compile the program using a case tool or a language compiler. This process detects syntax errors, which are language grammar errors. The programmer corrects the errors until the program executes properly. Next, the programmer desk checks the program. Desk checking is the process of reviewing the program code to spot logic errors, which produce incorrect results. This process can be performed by the person who wrote the program or by other programmers. Many organizations require a more formal type of desk checking called a structured walkthrough or code review. Typically, a group of three to five IT staff members participates in code review. The group usually consists of project team members and might include other programmers and analysts who did not work on the project. The objective is to have a peer group identify errors apply quality standards, and verify that the program meets the requirements of the system design specification. Errors found during a structured walkthrough are easier to fix while coding is still in the developmental stages. In addition to analyzing logic and program code, the project team usually holds a session with users called a design walkthrough to review the interface with a cross-section of people who will work with the new system and ensure that all necessary features have been included. This is a continuation of the modeling and prototyping effort that began early in the system's development process. The next step in application development is to initiate a sequence of unit testing, integration testing, and system testing, as shown in Figure 11-21. Unit Testing The testing of an individual program or module is called unit testing. The objective is to identify and eliminate execution errors that could cause the program to terminate abnormally and logic errors that could have been missed during desk checking. Test data should contain both correct data and erroneous data and should test all possible situations that could occur. For example, for a field that allows a range of numeric values, the test data should contain minimum values, maximum values, values outside the acceptable range, and alphanumeric characters. During testing, programmers can use software tools to determine the location and potential causes of program errors. During unit testing, programmers must test programs that interact with other programs and files individually before they are integrated into the system. This requires a technique called stub testing. In stub testing, the programmer simulates each program outcome or result and displays a message to indicate whether or not the program executed successfully. 
Each stub represents an entry or exit point that will be linked later to another program or data file. To obtain an independent analysis, someone other than the programmer who wrote the program usually creates the test data and reviews the results. Systems analysts frequently create test data during the system's design phase as part of an overall test plan. A test plan consists of detailed procedures that specify how and when the testing will be performed, who will participate, and what test data will be used. A comprehensive test plan should include scenarios for every possible situation the program could encounter. Regardless of who creates the test plan, the project manager or a designated analyst also reviews the final test results. Some organizations also require users to approve final unit test results. Integration testing Testing two or more programs that depend on each other is called integration testing. For example, consider an information system with a program that checks and validates customer credit status and a separate program that updates data in the customer master file. The output from the validation program becomes input to the master file update program. Testing the programs independently does not guarantee that the data passed between them is correct. Only by performing integration testing for this pair of programs can one ensure that the programs work together properly. Figure 11-21 shows integration testing for several groups of programs. Note that a program can have membership in two or more groups. Systems analysts usually develop the data they use in integration testing. As is the case with all forms of testing, integration test data must consider both normal and unusual situations. For example, integration testing might include passing typical records between two programs, followed by blank records, to simulate an unusual event or an operational problem. Test data that simulates actual conditions should be used because the interface that links the programs is being tested. A testing sequence should not move to the integration test stage unless it has performed properly in all unit tests. System testing. After completing integration testing, system testing is performed, which involves the entire information system, as shown in Figure 11-21. A system test includes all likely processing situations and is intended to assure users, developers, and managers that the program meets all specifications and that all necessary features have been included. During a system test, Users enter data, including samples of actual, or live, data, perform queries, and produce reports to simulate actual operating conditions. All processing options and outputs are verified by users and the IT project development team to ensure that the system functions correctly. Commercial software packages must undergo system testing similar to that of in-house developed systems, although unit and integration testing usually are not performed. Regardless of how the system was developed, system testing has the following major objectives. Perform a final test of all programs. Verify that the system will handle all input data properly, both valid and invalid. Ensure that the IT staff has the documentation and instructions needed to operate the system properly and that backup and restart capabilities of the system are adequate. The details of creating this sort of documentation are discussed later in this chapter. Demonstrate that users can interact with the system successfully. Verify that all system components are integrated properly and that actual processing situations will be handled correctly. Confirm that the information system can handle predicted volumes of data in a timely and efficient manner. Successful completion of system testing is the key to user and management approval, which is why system tests sometimes are called acceptance tests. Final acceptance tests however, are performed during systems installation and evaluation with actual user data, as described later in this chapter. How much testing is necessary depends on the situation and requires good judgment and input from other IT staff members, users, and management. Unfortunately, IT project managers often are pressured to finish testing quickly and hand the system over to users. Common reasons for premature or rushed testing are demands from users, tight systems development budgets, and demands from top management to finish projects early.
those pressures hinder the testing process and often have detrimental effects on the final product's quality. Testing can be a cost-effective means of providing a quality product. Every error caught during testing eliminates potential expenses and operational problems. No system, however, is 100% error-free. Often, errors go undetected until the system becomes operational. Errors that affect the integrity or accuracy of data must be corrected immediately. Minor errors, such as topographical errors in the user interface, can be corrected later. Some users want a system that is a completely finished product, while others realize that minor changes can be treated as maintenance items after the system is operational. In the final analysis, a decision must be made whether or not to postpone system installation if problems are discovered. If conflicting views exist, management will decide whether or not to install the system after a full discussion of the options. Documentation Documentation describes an information system and helps the users, managers, and IT staff who must interact with it. Accurate documentation can reduce system downtime, cut costs, and speed up maintenance tasks. Figure 11-22 shows an example of the REG research environment that can automate the documentation process and help software developers generate accurate, comprehensive reference material through detailed source code analysis. Documentation is essential for successful system operation and maintenance. In addition to supporting a system's users, accurate documentation is essential for IT staff members who must modify the system, add a new feature, or perform maintenance. Documentation includes program documentation, system documentation, operations documentation, and user documentation. Program documentation. Program documentation describes the inputs, outputs, and processing logic for all program modules. The program documentation process starts in the system's analysis phase and continues during system's implementation. Analysts prepare overall documentation, such as process descriptions and report layouts, early in the SDLC. This documentation guides programmers who construct modules that are well supported by internal and external comments and descriptions that can be understood and maintained easily. A systems analyst usually verifies that program documentation is complete and accurate. System developers also use defect tracking software, sometimes called bug tracking software, to document and track program defects, code changes, and replacement code, called patches. System documentation. System documentation describes the system's functions and how they are implemented. System documentation includes data dictionary entries, DFDs, object models, screen layouts, source documents, and the system's requests that initiated the project. System documentation is a necessary reference material for the programmers and analysts who must support and maintain the system. Most of the system documentation is prepared during the system's analysis and system's design phases. During the system's implementation phase, an analyst must review prior documentation to verify that it is complete, accurate, and up-to-date, including any changes made during the implementation process. For example, if a screen or report has been modified, the analyst must update the documentation. Updates to the system documentation should be made in a timely manner to prevent oversights. Operations documentation. If the information system environment involves a mainframe or centralized servers, the analyst must prepare documentation for the IT group that supports centralized operations. A mainframe installation might require the scheduling of batch jobs and the distribution of printed reports. In this type of environment, the IT operations staff serves as the first point of contact when users experience problems with the system. Operations documentation contains all the information needed for processing and distributing online and printed output. Typical operations documentation includes the following information. Program, Systems Analyst, Programmer, and System Identification. 
scheduling information for printed output, such as report run frequency and deadlines, input files and where they originate, output files and destinations, email and report distribution lists, special forms required, including online forms, error and informational messages to operators and restart procedures, special instructions, such as security requirements. Operations documentation should be clear, concise, and available online if possible. If the IT department has an operations group, the documentation should be reviewed with them, early and often, to identify any problems. By keeping the operations group informed at every phase of the SDLC, operations documentation can be developed as the project progresses. User Documentation User documentation consists of instructions and information to users who will interact with the system and includes user manuals, help screens, and online tutorials. Programmers or systems analysts usually create program documentation and system documentation. To produce effective and clear user documentation and hence have a successful project, Someone with expert skills in this area doing the development is needed, just as someone with expert skills developing the software is needed. The skill set required to develop documentation usually is not the same as that to develop a system. This is particularly true in the world of online documentation, which needs to coordinate with print documentation and intranet and internet information. Technical writing requires specialized skills and competent technical writers are valuable members of the IT team. Just as a system cannot be thrown together in several days, documentation cannot be added at the end of the project. While this has always been true of traditional user documentation, this is an even more critical issue now that online help and context-sensitive help are often used. Context-sensitive help is part of the program and it has to be tested too. Systems analysts usually are responsible for preparing documentation to help users learn the system. In larger companies, a technical support team that includes technical writers might assist in the preparation of user documentation and training materials. Regardless of the delivery method, user documentation must be clear, understandable, and readily accessible to users at all levels. User documentation includes the following. A system overview that clearly describes all major system features, capabilities, and limitations. Description of source document content, preparation, processing, and samples. Overview of menu and data entry screen options, contents, and processing instructions. Examples of reports that are produced regularly or available at the user's request, including samples. Security and audit trail information. Explanation of responsibility for specific input, output, or processing requirements. Procedures for requesting changes and reporting problems. Examples of exceptions and error situations. Frequently asked questions, FAQs. Explanation of how to get help and procedures for updating the user manual. Online documentation. Most users now prefer online documentation, which provides immediate help when they have questions or encounter problems. Many users are accustomed to context-sensitive help screens, hints and tips, hypertext, on-screen demos, and other user-friendly features commonly found in popular software packages. They expect the same kind of support for in-house developed software. If the system will include online documentation, the fact needs to be identified as one of the system requirements. If someone other than the analyst who are developing the system will create the documentation, that person or group needs to be involved as early as possible to become familiar with the software and begin developing the required documentation and support material. In addition, system developers must determine whether the documentation will be available from within the program or as a separate entity in the form of a tutorial, slide presentation, reference manual, or website. If necessary, links should be created within the program that will take the user to the appropriate documentation. Effective online documentation is an important productivity tool because it empowers users and reduces the time that IT staff members must spend in providing telephone, email, or face-to-face -face assistance. 
Interactive tutorials are especially popular with users who like to learn by doing, and visual impact is very important. The use of YouTube as a host for tutorial videos has become commonplace. For example, Figure 11-23 shows Learn Code Academy, which is a popular YouTube channel offering free web development and website design tutorials. In addition to program-based assistance, the Internet offers an entirely new level of comprehensive, immediate support. Many programs include links to websites, intranet sites, and Internet-based technical support. For example, the Cisco Systems website shown in Figure 11-24 offers a wide range of support services and social media links that allow Cisco users to collaborate and share their knowledge. Although online documentation is essential, written documentation material also is valuable, especially in training users and for reference purposes. Systems analysts or technical writers usually prepare the manual, but many companies invite users to review the material and participate in the development process. No matter what form of user documentation the system requires, keep in mind that it can take a good deal of time to develop. The time between finishing software coding and the time when a complete package, including documentation, can be released to users is entirely dependent on how well the documentation is planned in advance. If the completion of the project includes providing user documentation, this issue needs to be addressed from the very beginning of the project. Determining what the user documentation requirements are and ascertaining who will complete the documents are critical to a timely release of the project. Neglecting user documentation issues until after all the program is complete often leads to one of two things. Parenthesis, 1, in parenthesis. The documentation will be thrown together quickly just to get it out the door on time, and it more than likely will be inadequate. Or, parenthesis, 2, in parenthesis. It will be done correctly, and the product release will be delayed considerably. User training typically is scheduled when the system is installed. The training sessions offer an ideal opportunity to distribute the user manual and explain the procedures for updating it in the future. Training for users, managers, and IT staff is described later in this chapter. Installation After system testing is complete, the results are presented to management. The test results should be described, the status of all required documentation updated, and input from users who participated in system testing summarized. Detailed time schedules, cost estimates, and staffing requirements for making the system fully operational should also be provided. If system testing produced no technical, economical, or operational problems, management determines a schedule for system installation. The following system installation tasks are performed for every information systems project, whether the application is developed in-house or purchased as a commercial package. Prepare a separate operational and test environment. Perform system changeover. Perform data conversion. Provide training for users, managers, and IT staff. Carry out post-implementation tasks. Operational and test environments. Recall that an environment, or platform, is a specific combination of hardware and software. The environment for the actual system operation is called the operational environment or production environment. The environment that analysts and programmers use to develop and maintain programs is called the test environment. A separate test environment is necessary to maintain system security and integrity and protect the operational environment. Typically, the test environment resides on a limited access workstation or server located in the IT department. Access to the operational environment is limited to users and must strictly be controlled. Systems analysts and programmers should not have access to the operational environment except to correct a system problem or to make authorized modifications or enhancements. Otherwise, IT department members have no reason to access the day-to-day -day operational system. The test environment for an information system contains copies of all programs, procedures, and test data files. Before making any changes to an operational system, the analyst must verify them in the test environment and obtain user approval. 
Figure 11 minus 25 shows the differences between test environments and operational environments. An effective testing process is essential to ensuring product quality. Every experienced systems analyst can tell a story about an apparently innocent program change that was introduced without being tested properly. In those stories, the innocent change invariably ends up causing some unexpected and unwanted changes to the program. After any modification, the same acceptance tests that were run when the system was developed should be repeated. By restricting access to the operational area and performing all tests in a separate environment, the system can be protected and problems that could damage data or interrupt operations avoided. The operational environment includes hardware and software configurations and settings, system utilities, telecommunications resources, and any other components that might affect system performance. Because network capability is critically important in a client-server environment, connectivity, specifications, and performance must be verified before installing any applications. All communications features in the test environment should be checked carefully and then checked again after loading the applications into the operational environment. The documentation should identify all network specifications and settings, including technical and operational requirements for communications hardware and software. If network resources must be built or upgraded to support the new system, the platform must be tested rigorously before system installation begins. System Changeover System changeover is the process of putting the new information system online and retiring the old system. Changeover can be rapid or slow, depending on the method. The four changeover methods are direct cutover, parallel operation, pilot operation, and phased operation. Direct cutover is similar to throwing a switch that instantly changes over from the old system to the new. Parallel operation requires that both systems run simultaneously for a specified period, which is the slowest method. The other methods, pilot and phased operation, fall somewhere between direct cutover and parallel operation. Figure 11 minus 26 illustrates the four system changeover methods. Direct cutover. The direct cutover approach causes the changeover from the old system to the new system to occur immediately when the new system becomes operational. Direct cutover usually is the least expensive changeover method because the IT group has to operate and maintain only one system at a time. Direct cutover, however, involves more risk than other changeover methods. Regardless of how thoroughly and carefully testing and training is conducted, some difficulties can arise when the system goes into operation. Problems can result from data situations that were not tested or anticipated or from errors caused by users or operators. A system also can encounter difficulties because live data typically occurs in much larger volumes than test data. Although initial implementation problems are a concern with all four changeover methods, they are most significant when the direct cutover approach is used. Detecting minor errors also is more difficult with direct cutover because users cannot verify current output by comparing it to output from the old system. Major errors can cause a system process to terminate abnormally, and with the direct cutover method, reverting to the old system as a backup option is not possible. Companies often choose the direct cutover method for implementing commercial software packages because they feel that commercial packages involve less risk of total system failure. Commercial software is certainly not risk-free, but the software vendor usually maintains an extensive knowledge base and can supply reliable, prompt fixes for most problems. For systems developed in-house, most organizations use direct cutover only for non-critical situations. Direct cutover might be the only choice, however, if the operating environment cannot support both the old and new systems or if the old and new systems are incompatible. Timing is very important when using a direct cutover strategy. Most systems operate on weekly, monthly, quarterly, and yearly cycles. For example, consider a payroll system that produces output on a weekly basis. Some employees are paid twice a month. However, so the system also operates semi-monthly. Monthly, quarterly, and annual reports also require the system to produce output at the end of every month, quarter, and year. 
When a cyclical information system is implemented in the middle of any cycle, complete processing for the full cycle requires information from both the old and the new systems. To minimize the need to require information from two different systems, cyclical information systems usually are converted using the direct cutover method at the beginning of a quarter, calendar year, or fiscal year. Parallel Operation The parallel operation changeover method requires that both the old and the new information systems operate fully for a specified period. Data is input into both systems and output generated by the new system is compared with the equivalent output from the old system. When users, management, and the IT group are satisfied that the new system operates correctly, the old system is terminated. The most obvious advantage of parallel operation is lower risk. If the new system does not work correctly, the company can use the old system as a backup until appropriate changes are made. It is much easier to verify that the new system is working properly under parallel operation than under direct cutover, because the output from both systems is compared and verified during parallel operation. Parallel operation, however, does have some disadvantages. First, it is the costliest changeover method. Because both the old and the new systems are in full operation, the company pays for both systems during the parallel period. Users must work in both systems and the company might need temporary employees to handle the extra workload. In addition, running both systems might place a burden on the operating environment and cause processing delays. Parallel operation is not practical if the old and new systems are incompatible technically or if the operating environment cannot support both systems. Parallel operation also is inappropriate when the two systems perform different functions or if the new system involves a new method of business operations. Pilot operation The pilot operation changeover method involves implementing the complete new system at a selected location of the company. A new sales reporting system, for instance, might be implemented in only one branch office, or a new payroll system might be installed in only one department. In these examples, the group that uses the new system first is called the pilot site. During pilot operation, the old system continues to operate for the entire organization, including the pilot site. After the system proves successful at the pilot site, it is implemented in the rest of the organization, usually using the direct cutover method. Therefore, pilot operation is a combination of parallel operation and direct cutover methods. Restricting the implementation to a pilot site reduces the risk of system failure, compared with a direct cutover method. Operating both systems for only the pilot site is less expensive than a parallel operation for the entire company. In addition, if a parallel approach to complete the implementation is used later on, the changeover period can be much shorter if the system proves successful at the pilot site. Phased Operation the phased operation changeover method allows the new system to be implemented in stages or modules. For example, instead of implementing a new manufacturing system all at once, the materials management subsystem is installed first, then the production control subsystem, then the job cost subsystem, and so on. Each subsystem can be implemented by using any of the other three changeover methods. Analysts sometimes confuse phased and pilot operation methods. Both methods combine direct cutover and parallel operation to reduce risks and costs. With phased operation, however, only a part of the system is given to all users, while pilot operation provides the entire system but to only some users. One advantage of a phased approach is that the risk of errors or failures is limited to the implemented module only. For instance, if a new production control subsystem fails to operate properly, that failure might not affect the new purchasing subsystem or the existing shop floor control subsystem. Phased operation is less expensive than full parallel operation because the analyst has to work with only one part of the system at a time. A phased approach is not possible, however, if the system cannot be separated easily into logical modules or segments. In addition, if the system involves a large number of separate phases, phased operation can cost more than a pilot approach. Figure 11-27 shows that each changeover method has risk and cost factors. 
a systems analyst must weigh the advantages and disadvantages of each method and recommend the best choice in a given situation. The final changeover decision will be based on input from the IT staff, users, and management and the choice must reflect the nature of the business and the degree of acceptable risk. Data conversion. Data conversion is an important part of the system installation process. During data conversion, existing data is loaded into the new system. Depending on the system, data conversion can be done before, during, or after the operational environment is complete. A data conversion plan should be developed as early as possible, and the conversion process should be tested when the test environment is developed. When a new system replaces an existing system, the data conversion process should be automated, if possible. The old system might be capable of exporting data in an acceptable format for the new system or in a standard format, such as ASCII or ODBC. Open Database Connectivity ODBC, is an industry standard protocol that allows DBMSs from various vendors to interact and exchange data. Most database vendors provide ODBC drivers, which are a form of middleware. As discussed in Chapter 10, middleware connects to similar applications and enables them to communicate. If a standard format is not available, a program to extract the data and convert it to an acceptable format must be developed. Data conversion is more difficult when the new system replaces a manual system, because all data must be entered manually unless it can be scanned. Even when the data conversion is automated, a new system often requires additional data items, which might require manual entry. Strict input controls should be maintained during the conversion process, when data is extremely vulnerable. System control measures should be in place and operational to protect data from unauthorized access and to help prevent erroneous input. Even with careful data conversion and input controls, some errors will occur. For example, duplicate customer records or inconsistent part numbers might have been tolerated by the old system but will cause the new system to crash. Most organizations require that users verify all data, correct all errors, and supply every missing data item during conversion. Although the process can be time-consuming and expensive, it is essential that the new system be loaded with accurate, error-free data. Training. No system can be successful without proper training, whether it involves software, hardware, or manufacturing. A successful information system requires training for users, managers, and IT staff members. The entire system's development effort can depend on whether or not people understand the system and know how to use it effectively. Training plan. A training plan should be considered early in the system's development process. As documentation is created, consider how to use the material in future training sessions. When the system is implemented, it is essential to provide the right training for the right people at the right time. The first step is to identify who should receive training and what training is needed. The organization should be carefully examined to determine how the system will support business operations and who will be involved or affected. Figure 11-28 shows specific training topics for users, managers, and IT staff. Note that each group needs a mix of general background and detailed information to understand and use the system. As shown in Figure 11-28, the three main groups for training are users, managers, and IT staff. A manager does not need to understand every submenu or feature, but he or she does need a system overview to ensure that users are being trained properly and are using the system correctly. Similarly, users need to know how to perform their day-to-day -day job functions, but they do not need to know how the company allocates system operational charges among user departments. IT staff people probably need the most information. To support the new system, they must have a clear understanding of how the system functions, how it supports business requirements, and the skills that users need to operate the system and perform their tasks. After the objectives are identified, how the company will provide training must be determined. The main choices are to obtain training from vendors, outside training firms, or use IT staff and other in-house resources. Vendor Training 
If the system includes the purchase of software or hardware, then vendor supply training is one of the features that should be included in the requests for proposal RFP, and requests for quotation RFQ, that are sent to potential vendors. Many hardware and software vendors offer training programs free or at a nominal cost for the products they sell. In other cases, the company might negotiate the price for training, depending on their relationship with the vendor and the prospect of future purchases. The training usually is conducted at the vendor's site by experienced trainers who provide valuable hands-on experience. If a large number of people need training, classes may be held at the company's location. Vendor training often gives the best return on training dollars because it is focused on products that the vendor developed. The scope of vendor training, however, usually is limited to a standard version of the vendor's software or hardware. The vendor's training may have to be supplemented with in-house training, especially if the IT staff customize the vendor's package. Webinars, Podcasts, and Tutorials Many vendors offer web-based training options, including webinars, podcasts, and tutorials. A webinar which combines the words web and seminar, is an internet-based training session that provides an interactive experience. Most webinars are scheduled events with a group of pre-registered users and an online presenter or instructor. A pre-recorded webinar session also can be delivered as a webcast, which is a one-way transmission, whenever a user wants or needs training support. A podcast refers to a web-based broadcast that allows a user to download multimedia files to a PC or portable device. Podcasts can be pre-scheduled, made available on demand, or delivered as automatic updates, depending on a user's preference. An advantage of a podcast is that subscribers can access the recorded material anywhere, anytime. A tutorial is a series of online interactive lessons that present material and provide a dialogue with users. Software vendors can develop tutorials, or a company's IT team can develop them. They can also be developed by third parties for popular software packages and sold separately online. Outside Training Resources Independent training firms can also provide in-house hardware or software training. If vendor training is not practical and the project organization does not have the internal resources to perform the training, outside training consultants can be a viable alternative. The rapid expansion of information technology has produced tremendous growth in the computer training field. Many training consultants, institutes, and firms are available that provide either standardized or customized training packages. For example, Many people now use one of the many sources of online training, such as a demi shown in figure 11-29, to satisfy their training needs. Assistance can also be sought from non-profit sources with an interest in training, including universities, industry associations, and information management organizations. Training Tips the IT staff and user departments often share responsibility for developing and conducting training programs for internally developed software. If the organization has a service desk, their staff might be able to handle user training. Multimedia is an effective training method. Presentation software, such as Microsoft PowerPoint or Apple Keynote, can be used to design training sessions that combine slides, animation, and sound. Programs that capture actual keystrokes and mouse actions, such as Camtasia and Panopto shown in figure 11-30, in parenthesis, can be used to replay the screens as a demonstration for users. If a media or graphic arts group is available, they can help prepare training aids such as videos, charts, and other instructional materials. Keep the following guidelines in mind when developing a training program. Train people in groups with separate training programs for distinct groups. Group training makes the most efficient use of time and training facilities. In addition, if the group is small, trainees can learn from the questions and problems of others. A training program must address the job interests and skills of a wide range of participants. For example, IT staff personnel and users require very different information. Problems often arise when some participants have technical backgrounds and others do not. A single program will not meet everyone's needs. Select the most effective place to conduct the training. 
training employees at the company's location offers several advantages. Employees incur no travel expense, they can respond to local emergencies that require immediate attention, and training can take place in the actual environment where the system will operate. There can be some disadvantages, however. Employees who are distracted by telephone calls and other duties will not get the full benefit of the training. In addition, using the organization's computer facilities for training can disrupt normal operations and limit the amount of actual hands-on training. Provide for learning by hearing, seeing, and doing. Some people learn best from lectures, discussions, and question-and-answer sessions. Others learn best from viewing demonstrations or from reading documentation and other material. Most people learn best from hands-on experience. Training that supports each type of learning should be provided. Rely on previous trainees. After one group of users has been trained, they can assist others. Users often learn more quickly from coworkers who share common experience and job responsibilities. Using a train the trainer strategy, knowledgeable users can be selected who then conduct sessions for others. When utilizing train the trainer techniques, the initial training must include not only the use of the application or system but also some instruction on how to present the materials effectively. Interactive training. Usually, a relationship exists between training methods and costs. Training an airline pilot in a state-of-the-art simulator is quite different from helping corporate users learn a new inventory system. Obviously, training budgets are business decisions, and IT staff sometimes has to work with the resources that are available, rather than the resources they wish they had. Most people prefer hands-on training. However, other less expensive methods can be used including training manuals, printed handouts, and online materials. If a new system is being launched and the resources to develop formal training materials are lacking, a series of dialog boxes that respond with help information and suggestions whenever users select various menu topics can still be designed. A good user interface also includes helpful error messages and hints, as discussed in Chapter 8. However, the most effective training is interactive, self-paced, and multimedia-based. Online training and video tutorials are discussed in the following sections. Online training. Regardless of the instructional method, training lessons should include step-by-step -step instructions for using the features of the information system. Training materials should resemble actual screens, and tasks should be typical of a user's daily work. The more realistic, the better. Video lessons are particularly popular online. For example, Figure 11-31 shows a sample lesson on learning Python in an online tutorial from lynda.com. Sophisticated online training systems may offer interactive sessions where users can perform practice tasks and view feedback. Online training materials also should include a reference section that summarizes all options and commands, lists all possible error messages, and lists what actions the user should take when a problem arises. When training is complete, many organizations conduct a full-scale test, or simulation, which is a dress rehearsal for users and IT support staff. Organizations include all procedures, such as those that they execute only at the end of a month, quarter, or year, in the simulation. As questions or problems arise, the participants consult the system documentation, help screens, or each other to determine appropriate answers or actions. This full-scale test provides valuable experience and builds confidence for everyone involved with the new Post-implementation tasks. Once the new system is installed and operational, two additional tasks must be performed. Parenthesis, one, in parenthesis. Prepare a post-implementation evaluation, and parenthesis, two, in parenthesis. Deliver a final report to management. Post-implementation evaluation. A post-implementation evaluation assesses the overall quality of the information system. The evaluation verifies that the new system meets specified requirements, complies with user objectives, and produces the anticipated benefits. 
In addition, by providing feedback to the development team, the evaluation also helps improve IT development practices for future projects. A post-implementation evaluation should examine all aspects of the development effort and the end product. The developed information system. A typical evaluation includes feedback for the following areas. Accuracy, completeness, and timeliness of information system output. User satisfaction. System reliability and maintainability. Adequacy of system controls and security measures. Hardware efficiency and platform performance. Effectiveness of database implementation. Performance of the IT team. Completeness and quality of documentation. Quality and effectiveness of training. Accuracy of cost-benefit estimates and development schedules. The same fact-finding techniques can be applied in a post-implementation evaluation, which were used to determine the system requirements during the system's analysis phase. When evaluating a system, the following should be done. Interview members of management and key users. Observe users and computer operations personnel actually working with the new information system. Read all documentation and training materials. Examine all source documents, output reports, and screen displays. Use questionnaires to gather information and opinions from a large number of users. Analyze maintenance and help desk logs. Figure 11-32 shows the first page of a sample user evaluation form for the new information system where users evaluate 18 separate elements on a numerical scale, so the results can be tabulated easily. Following this section, the form provides space for open-ended comments and suggestions. Whenever possible, people who were not directly involved in developing the system should conduct the post-implementation evaluation. IT staff and users usually perform the evaluation, although some firms use an internal audit group or independent auditors to ensure the accuracy and completeness of the evaluation. When to perform a post-implementation evaluation for a new system is not always clear. Users can forget details of the developmental effort if too much time elapses before the evaluation. After several months or a year, for instance, users might not remember whether they learned a procedure through training, from user documentation, or by experimenting with a system on their own. Users also might forget their impressions of IT team members over time. An important purpose of the post-implementation evaluation is to improve the quality of IT department functions, including interaction with users, training, and documentation. Consequently, the evaluation team should perform the assessment while users are able to recall specific incidents, successes, and problems so they can offer suggestions for improvement. On the other hand, if the evaluation is done too soon, the users may not be able to provide sufficient feedback due to lack of experience with the new system. Post-implementation evaluation is primarily concerned with assessing the quality of the new system. If the team performs the evaluation too soon after implementation, users will not have enough time to learn the new system and appreciate its strengths and weaknesses. Although many IT professionals recommend conducting the evaluation after at least six months of system operation, pressure to finish the project sooner usually results in an earlier evaluation in order to allow the IT department to move on to other tasks. Ideally, conducting a post-implementation evaluation should be standard practice for all information systems projects. Sometimes, evaluations are skipped because users are eager to work with the new system or because IT staff members have more pressing priorities. In some organizations, management might not recognize the importance and benefits of a post-implementation evaluation. The evaluations are extremely important, however, because they enable the development team and the IT department to learn what worked and what did not work. Otherwise, developers might commit the same errors in another system. Final Report to Management At the end of each SDLC phase, a final report is submitted to management, and the system's implementation phase is no exception. The report should include the following. Final versions of all system documentation. Planned modifications and enhancements to the system that have been identified. Recap of all systems development costs and schedules. 
comparison of actual costs and schedules to the original estimates. Post-implementation evaluation, if it has been performed. The final report to management marks the end of systems development work. The next chapter examines the role of a systems analyst during systems operation, security, and support, which is the final phase of the SDLC. Summary The systems implementation phase consists of application development, testing, installation, and evaluation of the new system. During application development, analysts determine the overall design strategy and work with programmers to complete design, coding, testing, and documentation. QA is essential during the implementation phase. Many companies utilize software engineering concepts and quality standards established by the ISO. Each system's development approach has its own set of tools. For example, Structured development relies heavily on DFDs and structure charts. A structure chart consists of symbols that represent program modules, data couples, control couples, conditions, and loops. O-O methods use a variety of UML diagrams, including use case, class, sequence, and transition state diagrams. Agile methods tend to use iterative and incremental models. System developers also can use more generic tools to help them translate the system logic into properly functioning program modules. These tools include ERDs, flow charts, pseudocode, decision tables, and decision trees. Cohesion measures a module's scope and processing characteristics. A module that performs a single function or task has a high degree of cohesion, which is desirable. Coupling measures relationships and interdependence among modules. Modules that are relatively independent are loosely coupled, which is desirable. Cohesion and coupling concepts are not only used in structured development but also applicable to OOD. Typically, three steps are followed when creating a structure chart. DFDs and object models are reviewed to identify the processes and methods, identify the program modules and determine control subordinate relationships, and add symbols for couples and loops. The structure chart is then analyzed to ensure that it is consistent with the system documentation. If an agile development approach is used, then the customer creates user stories that describe required features and priority levels. In Agile methodology, new system releases are made after many iterations and each is test-driven carefully by the customer. Programmers perform desk checking, code review, and unit testing tasks during application development. Systems analysts design the initial test plans, which include test steps and test data for integration testing and system testing. Integration testing is necessary for programs that interact the final step is system testing for the completed system. System testing includes users in the testing process. In addition to system documentation, analysts and technical writers also prepare operations documentation and user documentation. Operations documentation provides instructions and information to the IT operations group. User documentation consists of instructions and information for users who interact with the system and includes user manuals, help screens, and tutorials. During the installation process, an operational, or production, environment is established for the new information system that is completely separate from the test environment. The operational environment contains live data and is accessible only by authorized users. All future changes to the system must be verified in the test environment before they are applied to the operational environment. System changeover is the process of putting the new system into operation. Four changeover methods exist, direct cutover, parallel operation, pilot operation, and phased operation. With direct cutover, the old system stops and the new system starts simultaneously. Direct cutover is the least expensive but the riskiest changeover method. With parallel operation, users operate both the old and new information systems for some period of time. Parallel operation is the most expensive and least risky of the changeover methods. Pilot operation and phased operation represent compromises between direct cutover and parallel operation. Both methods are less risky than direct cutover and less costly than parallel operation.
With pilot operation, a specified group within the organization uses the new system for a period of time, while the old system continues to operate for the rest of the users. After the system proves successful at the pilot site, it is implemented throughout the organization. With phased operation, the system is implemented in the entire organization, but only one module at a time, until the entire system is operational. Data conversion often is necessary when installing a new information system. When a new system replaces a computerized system, the data conversion process should be automated if possible. The old system might be capable of exporting data in a format that the new system can use, or the data might have to be extracted and converted to an acceptable format. Data conversion from a manual system often requires labor-intensive data entry or scanning. Even when data conversion can be automated, a new system often requires additional data items, which might require manual entry. Strict input controls are important during the conversion process to protect data integrity and quality. Typically, data is verified, corrected, and updated during the conversion process. Everyone who interacts with the new information system should receive training appropriate to his or her role and skills. The IT department usually is responsible for training. Software or hardware vendors or professional training organizations also can provide training. When a training program is developed, remember the following guidelines, train people in groups. Utilize people already trained to help train others. Develop separate programs for distinct employee groups. And provide for learning by using discussions, demonstrations, documentation, training manuals, tutorials, webinars, and podcasts. Users learn better with interactive, self-paced training methods. A post-implementation evaluation assesses and reports on the quality of the new system and the work done by the project team. Although it is best if people who are not involved in the system's development effort perform the evaluation, that is not always possible. The evaluation should be conducted early so users have a fresh recollection of the development effort but not before users have experience using the new system. The final report to management includes the final system documentation, describes any future system enhancements that already have been identified, and details the project costs. The report represents the end of the development effort and the beginning of the new system's operational life. Chapter Review Key Terms Acceptance Tests Application Development Attributes Bug tracking software. Capability maturity model, CMM, in parenthesis, registered trademark. Capability maturity model integration, CMMI, in parenthesis, registered trademark. Code review. Coding. Cohesion. Condition. Control couple. Control module. Coupling. Customer. Data conversion. Data couple. Defect tracking software. Design walkthrough. Desk checking. Direct cutover. Documentation. Flowchart. Integrated development environment, IDE. Integration testing. ISO 9000 3 to 2014. Iteration cycle. Iteration planning meeting. Library module. Logic errors. Loop. Loosely coupled. Methods. Modular design. Module. Object-oriented development, OOD. Online documentation. Open database connectivity, ODBC. Operational environment. Operations documentation. Pair programming. Parallel operation. Partitioning. Patches. Phased operation. Pilot operation. Pilot site. Podcast. Post-implementation evaluation. Process improvement. Production environment. Program documentation. Pseudocode. Quality assurance. Parenthesis. QA. In parenthesis. Release plan. Simulation. Software engineering. Status flag. Structure chart. Structured walkthrough. Stub testing. Subordinate modules. Syntax errors. System changeover. 
System documentation. System testing. Test data. Test-driven development, TDD. Test environment. Test plan. Tightly coupled. Top-down approach. Training plan. Train the trainer. Tutorial. Unit testing. User documentation. User story. Webcast. Webinar.